We are continuing to get new updates about the legal battle between the DOJ and Trump's lawyers over those classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Trump is objecting to the special master's request that he submit a sworn declaration of his repeated claims that during the search, the FBI planted evidence at Mar-a-Lago. Trump's legal team claims that the special master doesn't have the authority to require Trump to make this verification in court. Meanwhile, the Trump team is also arguing in a new filing that there are simply too many documents for any vendor to digitize and hand over to the special master for review. That's 11,000 documents and about 200,000 pages to be specific. Clearly, the Trump legal team has never done a complex commercial litigation case or a criminal defense paper case because it actually can be done. But remember, it was Trump's own legal team that demanded a special master to review the documents taken from Mar-a-Lago by the FBI. And the request was approved by a Trump-nominated judge in Florida. And the special master selected, you know, one of two that Trump proposed for the job. Now it appears that the Trump team is balking at the deadline for the special master's review. The filing reading, quote, in short, seasoned IT professionals who routinely work on large-scale document productions with the government cannot meet the government's proposed schedule, and it was never realistic for the government to suggest such a narrow time frame. That's in response to the DOJ's separate filing the day before, claiming, quote, plaintiff, Donald Trump, informed us this morning that none of the five document review vendors proposed by the government were willing to be engaged by plaintiff. The Trump team is asking for a deadline of mid-October in order to complete the full digitization and turnover of those government documents. So this begs the question, are we really supposed to believe that Trump's legal team is making this argument in good faith and that it's just not simply another tactic to delay the DOJ's investigation? Joining me now is Hugo Lowell. He's the United States congressional reporter for The Guardian. Hugo, we're mar a it today. You were with me when the redacted affidavit came out. We now have a, a slew of additional filings. The special master, Raymond Deary, he's been pushing back hardcore on so many of Trump's claims made in court, even asking the Trump team to provide proof that the FBI planted evidence at Mar-a-Lago, as they've been bemoaning for weeks now. So what's the Trump team claiming in its latest filing with regards to the vendor situation as well? Is there any sign that the special master is going to tell them, yo, this doesn't work with me. I am within my authority to make you do these things that I'm ordering to do. Look, I mean, Judge Deary hasn't weighed in on the on the latest with the document back and forth between Trump legal and the Justice Department. But some of the recent filings are quite interesting. I mean, the one thing that really stood out to me is, you know, Trump's legal team complaining that the volume of documents they actually have to sit through is 11,000 documents rather than 11,000 pages. I don't think that necessarily helps their case. It seems to suggest that the FBI sees even more material than uh, than we initially knew, and that, I think, doesn't bode well for Trump. But the fact that these five vendors that were suggested by the government don't want to work with Trump is also quite interesting. It's like they don't want to work. It's not clear why they don't want to work with him, but certainly Trump's legal team is saying it's because the volume of the documents is so great, they can't meet the deadlines. DOJ seems to suggest that's complete nonsense, and they're like, look, you know, we can go and find a vendor, and within a day we can retain them, and it will be very straightforward. Yeah, Hugo, it's it's interesting, right? It's 11,000 documents, but a total of 200,000 pages. So we have to ask ourselves this. Did Trump not realize that he took 200,000 pieces of paper? Or does Trump's legal team not understand what's happening here? Because 200,000 pieces of paper, it's a lot. But like I said in the intro, it can be done with a document vendor. So do you think that they're just digging themselves into a greater and greater hole the more that they're objecting about this review? Uh, potentially. I mean, when I was there for the first status conference in Brooklyn uh, with the special master and, and Trump's lawyers and, and the Justice Department lawyers, this judge really showed that he's a no-nonsense guy. And he was like, you know, for instance, with the classified documents, this debate over, you know, this supposed debate over whether these documents were classified, the judge goes, well, if you don't provide evidence to me that suggests that they're not classified, I'm going to believe the government because they have big classified letters and block capitals on the top of these documents. And so I think whether or not the Trump lawyers try and delay this further, try and pull you know, the, the timeline longer towards the end of the year, this is not the judge to do it with. Just, this isn't Judge Cannon down in uh, Florida. This is a really experienced, no-nonsense guy who has already indicated to Trump's legal team that he's not prepared to delay the process any more than it needs to be.
Yeah, listen, I think it's much ado about nothing at the end of the day, seeing how the classified documents and the ODNI, you know, review is ongoing. Although I would like, and I know the DOJ would like to have its hands on a Donald Trump sworn affidavit um, in support of that claim that the FBI planted evidence. Let's shift gears. Um, I always call you tip of sphere on this because you are one six committee. We know that that hearing was postponed, will likely occur maybe in the next few weeks, postponed because of Hurricane Ian. The next hearing, maybe the final, was supposed to focus on Roger Stone's role in the insurrection. Hugo, you and I have talked about this at length before. Um, this idea that we want to look for more of a connection from the White House, if not Trump himself, to the insurrectionists, the boots on the ground, with a through line, including people like Roger Stone, Steve Bannon, et cetera. What's the latest that you can tell us from your reporting about this upcoming 1-6 hearing? Yeah, so I checked in with a couple of uh, people on the, the congressional January 6th investigation over the weekend and kind of leading up to Wednesday when this uh, scheduled hearing was supposed to happen. Um, and they seem to suggest that they have new evidence that links Roger Stone closer to the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th and also closer to Trump. That's really interesting. The January 6th committee has previously said in its hearings that they are aware of Trump instructing Mark Meadows as then White House chief of staff to call operatives like Roger Stone and Michael Flynn the night before the Capitol attack. We don't know why. We don't know whether the phone calls are even connected or what they discussed if they were. But that, to date, was the most interesting and new evidence of a through line. And it would be very interesting whether the, the, the January 6th committee can substantiate that even further, because that's been the game from the start, right? Is there a direct link from Trump to the Capitol attack through these political operatives, because there's no way Trump was talking to people who actually stormed the Capitol. They're too low for him. But mm -hmm. could he be talking to political mm -hmm. operatives? We know he was. So whether or not there's a through line there, I think, is a central question. Yeah, before we switch gears, there is some reporting about Roger Stone allegedly asking for a second pardon, which would be intriguing if that were the case. Hugo, we know I and I've been a little bit uh, on this Ginny Thomas bandwagon. Um, it's really bothered me since the beginning. She's being interviewed as we speak right now. Not sure what she's saying. Can you just recap quickly for us why the 1-6 committee is finally getting around to it now? Um, I think it took a long time. Uh, I think it should have been a subpoena and not a voluntary appearance. But what can you tell us about some of the insight that the 1-6 committee members have shared with you about Ginny Thomas and her role in this insurrection? Look, Ginny Thomas has been a really vexing question for the select committee because they know that she, you know, she's the wife of the Supreme Court Justice, Chance Thomas, and that Chance Thomas was one of the dissenting, the only dissenting opinion uh, when uh, in, in the National Archives case about the January 6th committee trying to get hold of Trump's White House records from the National Archives. And so that always bothered the committee. The thing that tipped things over was when Ginny Thomas's name surfaced in emails uh, concerning John Eastman, the, the Trump legal advisor who was coordinating the uh, fake elector scheme and who was also trying to pressure Pence and giving him, uh, just frankly, un unlawful advice that he could go into Congress on January 6th and simply decertify the vote for Biden. And so when that connection emerged, I think the January 6th committee found that really alarming. And the whole mindset changed, and they really decided they needed to get Ginny Thomas in. Because if it is true that she's coordinating between people like John Eastman and the White House, and if it is true that there was a conspiracy to obstruct a congressional proceeding, and you know Judge Carter in, in California has already suggested on a preponderance of evidence that there is, then she might be roped into that conspiracy herself. And that would be a really significant development, as you know. I also think that they should have a chat with Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, but— Who's going to listen to me? Although Jenny Thomas is being interviewed. Hugo Lowell, U.S. congressional reporter for The Guardian. Thank you so much for being here and for getting us caught up. We appreciate you.